And that's all of the Portuguese I know. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm Jacob Page, and I work at GoDaddy. I'm usually the type of guy they just keep in the basement to code, not usually a guy to get up on stage. Uh, but, so if I go like this, by the way, um, in the front row, evacuate, because this is <coughs> my vomit uh, sign. So, so um, Functional reactive programming. This is a thing that's been around almost as long as JavaScript, but lately has been getting a lot of attention, a lot of uh, traction. But before I get too deep into this, I want to step back a bit and let's get a little philosophical. So I'm showing you here something extremely mundane and a lot of us app developers have to do boring stuff like this. Oh, it's not changing. Well, that's not good. Let's see if I can do it from the full screen. Oh, OK, that works. So let's say you're given this list of requirements. You want to show on a website a list of sales agents. And you want to only show the ones that have open offices. And you want to show the ones that are closest to the customer first. And other than that, order them randomly uh, so that they get equal chance for commissions. Um, yeah, pretty boring. I'm almost falling asleep talking about those requirements. But let's say you have uh, come up with an algorithm to implement this. So one approach is something like this. Oh, OK, well, let's create an empty array, loop through all of the sales reps. If one's not currently available, we'll go to the next one, calculate the distance. Uh, when you're done, finished looping, sort the array, create a new array B, loop five times, blah, 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 blah. So. So you've all seen code like this before, where you're building an array from another array with a series of steps. And somebody that's a little more seasoned uh, wouldn't need to do all this boilerplate, right? You would look over the requirements. They would see this text here, only show agents with open office hours. And you'd say, hey, this is basically just a filter. Or you see this part here and say, we want to display the contact information of sales agents. Well, that's saying take pieces of data from A and put them into B. That's map. And we want to uh, show the ones that are closest to the visitor first and then random order after that. OK, well, that's just a sort, right? And we only want to show five agents. That's a slice, right? So. The prior code was much more verbose. And this, but this one, if you're familiar with basic functional programming, uh, this is much, reads much clearer. OK, we'll just take the ori original array, we'll filter, we'll map, we'll sort, we'll slice, and then we'll do another map here. And if you use something like Lodash, it's even more brief, right? Because it, we take all of the common things that we do over and over again with arrays, and Plus, it adds some niceties like a lazy evaluation and stuff like this. So, so what does this have to do with functional reactive programming? Well, I would classify this code as much more elegant than the first set of code, right? But elegance is kind of a subjective term. For the sake of this talk, I'm going to define elegance as three different principles. It's code that's concise meaning you don't have a lot of boilerplate. You're not repeating yourself over and over again. Clear, uh, by using common terms like map and filter and, and things like that, it, the code's much more easy to understand. You don't, need, uh, you don't need to explain the code as much. And consistent, you use uh, similar patterns throughout your code base. So somebody that gains familiarity with one piece of the code can feel comfortable in the rest of the code. So let's talk about asynchronous code for a little while. 
in a way, it's JavaScript's greatest strength, and it's also kind of its greatest weakness. So I want to talk about uh, what I mean by that. So JavaScript gets a lot of things right. For the most part, when you run JavaScript, it doesn't ever block, and except for the case of like alert, confirm, and all that stuff. Who I don't know whose idea that was to put those in there. It's a single threaded, usually uses an event loop instead of parallel execution, so you don't have to lock to pr protect mutable state. Even if you do have parallel code with web workers and everything, you have usually you can communicate through message passing, the actor pattern. You know. And it's e really easy to do callbacks because you can do functioning expressions. But what's, so what's wrong? What's missing? Why do I say it also has async as a weakness? Well, one thing that's lacking is consistency in how you do asynchronous code. And another one is composability. Let me talk, let me explain what I mean by this. So here we have the humble callback. This is the basic building block of anything async in JavaScript. And here, here we see the, like a typical pattern in uh, an old school uh, jQuery where you just have a function, it's in line, and the list of parameters is really arbitrary. You have to read the documentation to know how to use any of these callbacks. Right? And you have the note style callbacks where you have the error as the first parameter. At any callback, you, of course, get the Christmas tree of doom where everything gets nested. And or you have async to help out with that a little bit. It's, it's still a little muddied you know, to, to understand what's going on. And then we have our redeemer for asynchronous functions, promises. And promises are really great and craves the way for the ES7 uh, async functions. Can't wait for those. So. Does this, have we solved our async problem through promises and async functions? Well, not really, because there's other types of async as well. And, and that's, we come to events. So the difference between an async function is you get back one result. But with events, you can get back n number of results. And you have lots of ways to do events as well. Here we have WebSockets API, uh, API where you just have properties for your callbacks. Or you've got event listeners, or you've got event emitters, and you've got you know all these time-based events as well. So there, and there's a lot more async than I have even talked about, but the thing is these are all isomorphic, and uh, if you're not familiar with that term, it's just a fancy way of saying they all have the same shape. Uh, let me let me explain what I mean. So if you think about it, an event is just a moment of time plus a piece of data. An async result is a moment in time, which is when you're called back, and a piece of data. So let's, let's think about a Node.js stream. It's a sequence of data events over time. An event emitter emits a sequence of events over time. An event listener receives a sequence of events over time. Set interval handler emits a sequence of events over time. I think you see where I'm getting with this, you know. But even if it's just one event, like a set timeout handler, that's a sequence of events over time. It's just one event. Right? Or a promise, it's a sequence one event over time. So basically, all callbacks are isomorphic. And if you stretch the definition a little bit, you can even make an, any iterable into, a, it's kind of isomorphic. It's a sequence of values, right? It's over time, kind of, if you say immediate is that time. So why is this all important? Uh, because they're all isomorphic, they can be adapted into one unified type. And because you can, uh, and what this type is called, it's, it's different uh, for every single uh, uh, library out there. You've got, you can call them observables, you can call them streams, you can call them signals. Um, in, in this talk, I'll be calling them uh, streams. And, and what can you do with a, with a stream? You can listen for a value, 
uh, depending on the library, you might listen for errors. And then it ends. And then you can unsubscribe from these streams. And if this looks familiar to, all, to anyone that's familiar with design patterns, this is basically the observer pattern. So what is reactive programming? All reactive programming is, is modeling your application as the propagation of change through data flows. And another way of thinking of a data flow is it's a stream of events. So functional reactive programming. Ooh, did I skip here? No. So, so basically, with if you have a single type to represent all of these async things, then what you can do is you have the power to combine them through a common toolkit. So that's what functional reactive programming is. You're managing these data flows or event streams through functional programming techniques, just like the ones we looked at at the beginning here. For example, so map. You all know what map does for an array. You take all of the values in the array, you apply a function to them, and you create a new array. Well, you can do the same thing with an event stream. Over time, if you're receiving circles and you map it with a convert to triangles, you get now a stream that produces triangles. And the reason why you can use uh, a function like map on both a, an event stream and an array is because uh, they're both uh, isomorphic. They're both what you call functors in the uh, functional programming world. And you, you've got all the other goodies of functors in uh, event streams. Flat map, except so flat map, you map a value in an array to another array, and it flattens it all into one big array. Well, you can do the same thing with event streams. If you map an event to another stream of events, you can flat map them into one stream. Filter, you've got that as well. Scan. Scan is a way of holding state in a stream. It works kind of like reduce, if you're not familiar with scan, uh, but it holds the value and emits the changes over time. Here we have a stream that just keeps track of a running total. So we have a stream of numbers, we scan over it, we have an initial value of zero, and then we, we just do a sum. And uh, it's not just values that you can operate over in these streams, you also can operate on the time aspect as well, because remember, streams are not just data, streams are data plus time. So throttle, for example, let's say you have a noisy channel and you only want to receive a message every thousand milliseconds, there you go. And debounce, it's kind of like throttle, but it's more like waiting for a signal changes to die down before emitting, uh, before emitting values. We've got zip, which is pairing up two different values in a stream uh, and combining them into one stream. Merge, you can take two streams and smash them down into one. And combine, which is where as soon as either stream produces a new value, you pair it with the latest value from the other stream. So to, I've got a little game to demonstrate. It's kind of hard to understand what the power of is of using functional reactive programming until you see an application. Uh, so I need your help. If anyone's got any sort of data connection, let's see if you can join this game. Just go to the URL on the top. Let's see if anyone's able to join. If not, I'll have to pretend to be a player on your behalf. Uh, oh, we got one player, and we have a uh, an opponent. Okay, let's give this some time. Now, believe, you know, not to oversell this, but this is the greatest game ever created. Like the virtual reality is nothing, you know. Mario and Sonic. Ah, wait till you play this thing. Oh, we got some good participation. I'm excited. Four, three, two, one. Oh, 
Oh, looks like red is... Oh, it's really kind of... Oh, wow, red is totally dominating this contest here. You guys are really fast clickers. You must have a lot of experience or something. Come on, blue, you can rally. Put, a, put your back into it. Oh, oh, red, wow, red is dominating. Oh, can you reach 10,000? Oh, I've never seen the numbers go this high. Congratulations, Red. Okay, and looks like Gabriel Carvalho de Campesna, 255 points. Who's our, who's our MVP there? Hey, your prize is going to be a high five after the, my talk. <laughs> so congratulations. So let me talk about how this application was built. It's basically made up of four components, all of which are written in JavaScript. We've got some Node on the back end, and I've got a React on the front end. So first off, we have the client code that you're all running on your phones or, or laptops or whatever. And it connects up to a server, which I'm calling player agents. They take care of uh, um, serving your requests. And then we need to centralize the state of the game with a state server. So all those player agents talk to the state server, and then we had the thing that showed up on the board. So, to, so let's uh, look at the data model that I created for this. So it's really important that you model your data if you're writing a functional reactive program because you, you, need, to, you need to understand the flow. As a, think of it as like a series of tubes, if you will. Uh, incoming events, and then outgoing. So at the very top here, we have connections. This is uh, when, when your uh, game connects to the player agent. That's kind of like a stream. Uh, it will reestablish a connection if it's broken. Uh, and once it establishes a connection, then it emits the socket as the value of that stream. And then, that, and then from there, we derive inbound messages. And I'll get more into this. But you see, the important part is it's a unidirectional flow. There's no loops going on here. The data filters down from the inputs down to the output. So uh, I already talked about all this. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of choices in making these streams. Um, RxJS is probably the most well-known. Uh, this is a really good choice if, you're, if you have a backend in something that's other than JavaScript because there's an Rx uh, platform for uh, everything. Uh, BaconJS is, um, uh, is, is also a very popular. Uh, I, I ended up use, going with uh, Kefir because it's, uh, of its high performance. Uh, and it's also a little bit slow, uh, smaller. So uh, it didn't take as long to download in our Wi-Fi. So starting at the top, here's that connection stream. Basically, when we want to repeat, and uh, here we see creating a stream uh, with an adapter, uh, where it takes an emitter, basically, and connects it up to a WebSocket. So um, as soon as the socket doesn't open, then we emit that socket and say, hey, this is the connection for the stream. And uh, and I set it, did a little set timeout on there so it doesn't uh, keep on retrying uh, for too long. And inbound messages. Here we start to see where we can produce one, cause one stream to produce another. We take that connection stream and we flat map it by uh, converting that stream into a new stream of on message events. And then we map that and we part, uh, by parsing the data. Now we can take those inbound messages, and let's say I had get multiple types of messages, and I want to just filter the ones that have a property that says type is state. That's all we have to do, filter. And then we can say, hey, let's extract that with a map. So the way I kept all the, t the uh, clocks in sync is by keeping track of the time drift, which is the difference between the clocks on the server and the clocks on your devices. So Kefir has a nice little sliding window a function that basically says, capture the last five values from the stream, max uh, minimum of one. And then we just do a reduce and a divide to get to do the sum and get the average. 
and now our state um, that, that, can, that holds the state of the game is basically combining those state messages with the time drift and mapping it and uh, correcting the clock. And, and now as far as drawing the thing, if you think about it, animation frames inside of the UI, that's a stream. It's a stream of frames. So here I adapted a request animation frame in, into a stream. Now that I've got the animation frames and I've got the state stream, inside of my React component here, all I have to do is combine those two streams. And then as soon as we get a value for that, I'm gonna push it down into the state of the component and then pass those into the properties of the UI components. And that's how you get everything rendering. So that takes care of all the inputs, right? That, this, that's the uh, server syncing with you and saying, this is what the, the score of the game is. But what about the outputs, all the clicks, and when you joined the game? Well, um, here I used an event emitter. And when, I, when you handle the click event or the join event, it just uh, it emits that click or join event. And then all we have to do is merge those two streams, the clicks and the joins, and, and then uh, send it out uh, through a socket. So that's an example in, in one of the components of, of what a functional reactive program looks like. The, the player agent uh, process, it, it actually takes two input streams. It takes the one from the central state server. It takes the connections from the players. It gets those streams and uh, crosses them over. It takes state messages from the state server, sends it out to the uh, player and it takes the uh, player messages and sends them to the state server. And then here in the state server, we see uh, a nice little web here of keeping track of state. Uh, it keeps track of all the joins and the leaves and the clicks, and then uses that to build a roster. Uh, it uses that to track the status of the game and keep track of the score. So here we have one example. It's basically a series of scans. We take the joinings and the leavings and the disconnections, and we modify the, the roster, the list of players. So with any new paradigm, there's always some gotchas. Like, if anyone remembers when the first time you learned functional programming, at least for me, it was kind of a mind-bending ex experience. It changed the way you thought about things. Right? Instead of low-level uh, loops and mut mut uh, mutating data, it was all about operations of data over time. Uh, so when you get into functional reactive programming, uh, the, the number one tip I would give is always model the problem first before you dive in coding. I'll, I'll show you guys the, uh, the, the GitHub link for the project uh, at, at the end of the talk, but if you want to uh, laugh at me a little bit, you can look at my commit history and see because I just dove in and didn't model the program at first, it was a real mess. But once you actually have an understanding of the problem, uh, then you can make a much cleaner code that works well. So one of the common things that you can get yourself into trouble is uh, circular dependencies, which we all know is a really bad thing no matter what programming paradigm you use. In my case, it was because of that game loop. You start off the, the, the server, it says, waiting for players. And it waits and waits, and if there's no players, it keeps on waiting. And then once the players join, then it does a countdown, and then it goes to the, um, a new waiting period. So it's a big cycle. And so because I didn't think about that clearly, I ended up with a circular loop here. And as you know, if you have a dependency that tries to require another dependency, it's going to be, you'll get the, the dreaded undefined is not a function, you know, all that stuff. So how do, I, how do you resolve that in the functional reactive programming world? Well, you can either design your flow to make sure it's not circular. Um, there's also a nice little thing called a pool in the kefir world, or what you call a bus in bacon, which is where something can plug itself in to a source, uh, as a source, in, into a pool. So here, the different states of my, uh, of my status they plug things into the timers, and they also receive events from the timers stream. So that's what my game like, loop looks like, and uh, my uh, circular uh, state was uh, resolved. 
So another common gotcha is something called lazy subscriptions in the world of Kafir. Uh, basically, the, what a lazy subscription means is a stream doesn't start producing events until somebody's listening. Something has to pull the events out of the stream before anything happens. So let, let me talk about a, a weird thing that I noticed when I was developing this game. I noticed when I started this uh, player agent that I was not it wasn't connecting to the state server at all. And I was, couldn't figure it out. Like, why is it not connecting to the state server? And it turns out it's because of lazy subscriptions. If you think about it, when you first start the server, the, the socket doesn't exist yet. There's no uh, connections. So because that doesn't exist, all of these things here don't exist yet. And because those don't exist, there's nothing subscribed to that state stream. And because nothing's subscribed to the state stream, it propagates up the chain. And there's nothing here that's establishing that connection. So normally, this works to your advantage. Like, it's OK to have a lazy subscription because you don't, I don't need the connection to the state server yet um, because, because nobody's listening. But sometimes, sometimes that's not exactly what you want. Um, so in some functional reactive programming uh, libraries, you can actually turn off that lazy subscription, or you can just, uh, or you can just uh, add a uh, eager consumption here, uh, just a dummy subscription to start pulling the data and turning the cogs of, of the great machine. So let me talk about, let's, let's Let's discuss this a little bit. Why, so what's the reason for using functional reactive programming? It's the same reason that we went to functional programming in the beginning. Uh, it's because you're converting the procedural low-level event handlers to declarative high-level operations uh, that you're familiar with from functional programming. And basically, it's more elegant. So using our definition from before, it's more concise. You don't have all this event handling boilerplate. It's common tasks like map and filter. You can uh, do things with a minimum of code. Uh, and that also makes it more clear. You don't have to read through procedural code to understand what's, what's going on. As long as you understand these basic concepts, the, the data flow becomes crystal clear. And it's consistent. Instead of having all of those async patterns mixed together, like mixing promises and uh, node callbacks and, uh, and event emitters and all that. You can just have one unified stream type. So uh, oh, but my slide is not up to date. Uh, my Twitter is actually A-P-O-C-K-O. -O. Um, I'll, I'll share the uh, link to the, uh, to the game there. Um, and uh, this is my uh, GitHub page that contains the game demo. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, participating and helping me out. And obrigado. <laughs>